So I've had a request for a talk for this evening. It's a very worthwhile request. They were looking uh, in the a library of talks, uh, either on the internet or in the library, for a talk to help one of their friends with uh, depression. And even though I, I thought I'd uh, talked about that subject before, maybe I haven't devoted a whole talk to that subject. So for the sake of uh, people now and in the future, this evening's talk will be on the Buddhist attitude towards depression. It is a worthwhile topic because, as everybody knows, that depression is one of the great diseases in our modern world. It causes a great deal of suffering and many of us will meet with depression either personally or one of our loved ones in the course of our life. And it's also well known that the Buddhist attitudes are very effective in countering the problems of depression. You only need to mention that our former Premier, uh, Jeff Gallup, uh, when he resigned because of depression at the height of his political fame and ability, he actually came to see me. And uh, he credits uh, Buddhist teachings and Eastern philosophy as getting him through his depression. And so that you know, we do have the goods. So what are those goods which actually heal and help with people's depression? Well, first of all, because I've given talks on depression before, or at least mentioned it, uh, a psychiatrist did pull me up to say, and I'm going to mention this at the very beginning of this talk, that there are severe forms of depression. I'm talking about very clinical uh, bad cases of depression, which should be treated by a qualified doctor first of all. The source of depression which I'm talking about this evening are those ones which are not so severe as to totally incapacitate you. Uh, however, the other types of depression which uh, one is still has mostly one's mental faculties, one can get out and about, but one still has this deep sense of uh, greyness to one's life called depression. So if it is severe, please go and see a um, doctor. But if it's moderate or mild, or to prevent it happening in the first place, please listen to what uh, I'm about to say. And uh, contemplating this before I came in here, I could sort of see like three major causes of depression in our world. And first, and especially in our modern world, it does seem that depression is uh, a modern sickness that didn't seem to have so much incidence in the past. And I think one of the reasons is, is because the inherent negativity and fault finding in our society. So that's one of the first things I'm going to talk about, to how to counteract negativity and fault finding. And the secondly, it is a direct consequence of the amount of craving and desires we have in our modern world. We tend to think we need so much more uh, both materially and socially than maybe in the past. You know, we've lost the sense of uh, respecting simplicity. And lastly, and more profoundly, just because of some of the nature of existence can be very depressing. And there's this last particular aspect which very easily responds to what you just did uh, a few minutes ago in meditation. So there's the three parts of this talk. You know, the negativity and fault finding, the, uh, the, over, the over indulgence in cravings and also something more profound about the nature of life itself. But the first one is the first part which I often talk about and Buddhists often help with saying that a lot of the problem with depression is because of an inherent negativity and fault finding which is in our modern society. You look at your life that when you are at school people are always uh, judging you and often negatively. Uh, not everyone can come top of the class, not everybody can sort of get one of these medals and everybody else tends to think they are a loser. Not everyone can find a nice relationship with the boy or the girl that they love 
And so even at that time when you're searching for a partner in life, it's just so hard to get what you think is the perfect partner. And again, people in relationships think they're losers. And in life, you try to get a job, you try to do well in your career, you try to get on in the world and people are pushing you and sometimes they ask you, you know, you're 40, 50 years of age, what are you doing? You're sort of, you know, you're serving burgers in McDonald's, is that all you're doing? You're a failure, you're a loser. Isn't it the case that people are just so critical and want to put you down, even though you may be able to serve the best veggie burgers in the whole of the McDonald's chains of restaurants? But what does that mean? It means that there's so much negativity in our worlds, always people pointing out the faults and pointing out your faults. And what happens when you get married or you have a nice relationship for the first couple of years? Yeah, people love each other, then they start pointing out the faults. It's one of those great stories. That's you know, the person who got married. And he used to say, it's the father in law took the daughter-in-law, no, his father-in-law took his new son-in-law aside. So you probably love my, my, my daughter very much. Yes, I've just married her, she's beautiful, she's charming, she's wonderful. Even the way she puts her finger in her ear to get the wax out is charming. And he said, that's what it's like when you get married, everything you do is just lovable. And the father-in-law said, but in one or two years time, you'll start to see the faults and defects in my daughter. But please, son-in-law, always remember this. Always remember, if my daughter did not have those faults to begin with, she would have married someone much better than you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually a very profound thing he's saying there, because, look, you know, how can you expect to get a perfect partner when you're not perfect? So isn't it the case, because we're so fault-finding, that's one of the reasons why relationships now have a difficult road, why it's so tough to keep a partner. Because we're always finding faults with them and they're finding faults with you. You know what that does? That sucks, that takes all the happiness and joy out of the marriage. So where is all this negative, negativity and fault finding coming from? It's actually almost, it's um, brainwashed into us and so, since we're very young. You know, at school, in the playground, you know, going out together. We're just so fault-finding. To the point that people start to believe all that negative input to their brain. I'm not big, uh, beautiful enough, I'm not charming enough, I'm not intelligent enough, I'm not this enough, until we eventually we believe it. And of course, that's a huge amount of depression which comes up. Because we are not good enough. I still remember this when I first came to Perth, the very first year, this 13 year old girl came to see me. Her father organized a meeting. She wanted counseling. She'd been to all the other psychologists, psychiatrists or whatever in Perth. And this was the last resort to go and see a Buddhist monk. They must have been desperate in those days to come and see a Buddhist monk. Because we didn't have much of a reputation. And I asked her, what's your problem? And she took a long time to get it out of her. Because you know when people really feel they have a big problem and they just don't want to share it with you, especially a 13 or 14 year old young girl. And eventually I got it out of her. She said, looking down at the floor, feeling so embarrassed, she said, my nose is too big. <laughs> now, you know, you girls, you know that. You know, you know where she's coming from. That to her, every time she looked in the mirror, she saw her nose and it was too big. And, I tried to use like a scientific approach to her problem. You know, I mentally measured her nose and I've seen many noses in my life and I measured it in my mind and I told her, lady, that your nose is pretty average. It's not the most beautiful nose, it's certainly not the most ugly nose, it's just the nose, it's average, okay, but she wouldn't accept that. For her, it was the biggest problem because it was right in front of her face. I didn't, I didn't actually help her. But she helped me to understand sort of the negativity of fault finding. You can see a nose and you exaggerate it simply because you're looking for faults. It is that nature of our human mind when it hasn't been proper trained to always see what's wrong in things rather than what is right. And that attitude causes a lot of depression. 
I'm going to have to ask you to excuse me though who, who come here every week for the last 10 or 20 years. Many of you have heard these stories before but because this is a talk on depression and many people are going to hear this for the first time. One of the classic stories is that story of the two bad bricks in the wall. On Tuesday night I was in Brisbane. First time I've been to Brisbane to give talks and one of the people having question time said, Ajahn Brahm, I've read that story, I've heard it many times, can you please tell it again? I just want to hear it live. <laughs> <laughs> so I told that story and it's a deep story, simple but it actually points out what I'm talking about. The story of the two bad bricks in the wall 26 years ago, 27 years ago when we moved to Serpentine to build that monastery down there we had no money, we were broke and because we, didn't, we owed money for the land, there was no buildings on that property so I had to learn how to build and I was a theoretical physicist before, okay, in my head doing sums all day now I had to get out there and get my hands dirty and mix concrete and lay bricks and put on a roof and do plumbing, everything we did. And even to this day, if any of you go into that main hall in our monastery, I am the builder. My name is on the building license for that. And it's still standing, so that's pretty good. <laughs> so in particular, this story, I had to learn how to lay bricks. Laying bricks was not a simple thing to do. It may look easy, but it's so hard to get everything level. But, as most people would be, I was a perfectionist. I had to make sure that brick was perfectly level before I went on to the next one. Sometimes one corner was high, you'd knock it down and another corner would go up. You knock that corner down, then it would go out of line. You knock it back into line again, thinking it was finished, you notice one of the corners was high again. It was just one of those jobs which you, know, you couldn't get it, everything in the right place. But you kept on trying until you got it. It took a long time but it didn't matter because I wasn't being paid so I could take however long I wanted. And when I finished that wall, that first brick wall, like anybody else, you were proud, finished, you stood back to look at it and admire it. And it was only then, when it was finished, I noticed that two bricks were crooked. And all the other bricks were straight, two bricks were crooked. So what would you do? What I did was try and scrape the mortar out so I could reset the bricks so they could be perfect. But the mortar was hard, you couldn't scrape it out. And the other monk was with me at the time, Ajahn Chakra. I asked him, Look, can we afford, can we please afford some dynamite so I can blow it up and start again? <laughs> Bulldozer would do, push it over. Because that spoiled the whole wall. Those two bad bricks, they ruined the whole thing. But we couldn't, I was stuck with it. We were too poor to do anything with it. So for three months, every time I went past that wall I saw my mistakes and I felt so sad. I'd stuffed up. And the worst thing about stuffing up when you're building, everybody could see it. You, know, you can't hide it. It's a big wall out there in the open. So, every time there was a visitor, I would actually volunteer to take them around so I could you know, take them somewhere else so they wouldn't see my mistakes. At night time I'd have nightmares about that wall. <laughs> I would, I'd dream of it because you know, I'd, I'd really made a big mistake and everybody could see it. And it was three months, roughly, I'm not quite sure, it's a long time ago now, about three months, somebody else was with me and they saw that wall and they said, that's a beautiful wall. And I just couldn't believe what I heard, because for three months I'd been suffering so much with that wall. And they said, it's a beautiful wall. My first reaction was to ask them, are you visually impaired? Are you blind? Did you leave your glasses in the car? Can't you see those two bad bricks, the crooked ones? And what they said next just changed much of the way I look at life and stopped a lot of inherent depression in myself. What they said said, yes, I can see the two bad bricks, but I can also see the 998 good bricks as well. And that really hit me. Because I realized for three months I was blind. All I ever saw was my two mistakes. And I just could not see all the beautiful perfect bricks which I had laid. And when that guy told me, what about the 998 good bricks? That was the first time in three months that I could actually see the bricks above, below, to the left and the right of my two mistakes. 
And I had to agree with the fellow. It was a beautiful walk. Once I could see the whole picture. And I realized, why is it, our psychology, where do we get this from? That we just see our two mistakes and we become blind to everything else we've ever done. Or every other part of that relationship, that life, that project, we just see one or two mistakes and that totally obsesses us to the point where well, I wanted to destroy that wall. I wanted to blow it up. Now can you understand what depression comes from? A lot of times, mistakes happen in life, tragedies occur, a loved one dies, you get cancer, you lose your job, lose everything in the stock market, one day you're Prime Minister, next day you're not. <laughs> so you can see it's very easy to get depressed. If all you see is just that one event, that one or two bad bricks. So how do you overcome that fault finding and negativity? Fault finding and negativity is just being obsessed with what is wrong and being totally blind to anything else except the faults. And then you want to destroy. You see that happening in relationships, girls and boys, they come along and they just see what's wrong in their partner, the things they do wrong, the mistakes they've made. And they're just being blind to everything else. The classic tale was when I was in teaching in Malaysia and somebody asked me this question at the end of the talk. I have uh, found out this morning my husband has lied to me. My husband has lied. I can't trust him anymore. Should I get divorced? She asked me whether she should get divorced. Quickly I asked her, what are you doing in this university? She was a lecturer on mathematics. So I saw an opportunity to answer her question. I asked, how long have you been married? She said, three years. I said, let's do some statistics. Three years is maybe 1,000 days. And let's say for the sake of this argument, let's assume that on average throughout your three years of marriage, your husband has said maybe 20 things to you every day, on average, which could be right, which could be wrong. So he said 20,000 statements to you since you've been married, and now he's lied for the first time. According to probability theory, on his past record, the next time he opens his mouth, there is a 20,000 to 1 chance he's telling the truth. What do you mean you can't trust him? <laughs> Isn't that pretty good odds? 20,000 to 1? If every time a politician opened their mouth with 20,000 one to one chance they're telling the truth, I'd vote for them, wouldn't you? <laughs> They'd be trustworthy. But you can see what we pointed out there. Why is it that one lie, a real lie, they lied. Why is that given so much prominence and everything else is totally forgotten, ignored? This is the stupidity of our human being which is just so fault-finding and negative it hasn't got a balanced perspective on life. That lady wanted to destroy her marriage. Once I told her that story, they stayed together. And it's the same with you, you make one mistake. Life makes one mistake. If you make one mistake, is that worth killing yourself for? You know, a lot of suicides happen because of, see, just two bad bricks in the wall, you want to kill yourself? You can't see the 998 good bricks. That story tells you what's going on, and anyway, I can't resist um, adding the beautiful ending to that story of the two bad bricks. Once when I was teaching in a cancer support association over in Cottesloe, they're still over there, teaching, <coughs> teaching that story, because sometimes going through chemotherapy and radiation therapy can really cause a lot of depression. So I told that, and they, yeah, you've got cancer, but there's many other things happening in your life. Look at all the parts of the body which haven't got cancer. There's two bad bricks there, two bad tumours. What about the other parts which are beautiful, which are healthy? Look at that. It actually takes away a lot of fear. And when he went, I told that one of these builders came up afterwards and he said, Ajahn Brahm, please don't be upset you made two mistakes when you're laying bricks. Professional builders do the same, he said. But then he said, I'll tell you a secret. And I told his secret to millions of people. <laughs> Internationally. <laughs> He said, don't tell me your secrets, they'll be on the YouTube next day. <laughs> he said, sort of, in the building industry where we make a mistake like that, we call it a feature. 
record it a feature and we charge our clients an extra few thousand dollars for it. <laughs> so those of you who've got features in your house, they probably started off as mistakes. And I love that because this actually takes what we'd normally be negative about and realizing that that's a feature of your partner and of yourself. That's what makes them lovable. If they were so perfect, they'd just be impossible to love. There'd be no real meaning to that love. So it's their imperfection, their features. If you look upon it as a feature, it makes loving them more valuable. So that's the first story of overcoming depression by realizing that you're just seeing two bad bricks in the wall. You need someone to point out what else is happening in your life, in your body, in your relationship. And you realize you see the big picture and it's not so negative anymore. Even just the other thing about negativity, which is one of the stories which I tell more often than probably any other story, and that is just why people, they look upon their past and they get so negative about something which happened to you. You know, you might get depressed because you got pinged by the police today for speeding. You might get depressed because, you know, you've lost your job today. You may get depressed because this week, you know, that uh, your partner sort of dumped you. Why is it people get depressed like that? I'll tell you why, the two chicken farmers story, my famous favorite story. And the reason why I keep repeating this is because people need to know this so they don't suffer so much. Two chicken farmers, the first chicken farmer went into the shed early in the morning to collect the produce from the night before, took it in the basket and filled the basket full of chicken shit. And he left the eggs in the shed to rot. He brought the shit back into the house. He stuck the whole house out. He was a very dumb chicken farmer. There's a meaning to this story, so stay with me. <laughs> Second chicken farmer went into the shed with a basket and he put eggs in the basket. He left the shit in the shed because it will become valuable fertilizer later on, but you don't bring it into the house with you. You bring the eggs back into the house so he could make an omelette for his family and sell the rest of the eggs in the market for cash. That's a smart chicken farmer. That's what he's supposed to do. And the moral of that story, this was told by Ajahn Chah. He said, when you collect the produce of your past and bring it into your present, what do you bring with you? When you collect what's done today or this week, what do you bring home with you? Are you shit collectors or egg collectors? And you know what you are, you're all shit collectors mostly. <laughs> We're negative. When things happen to you, you got pinged by the police, that's what you tell your partner. Oh, a terrible day at work, this happened and that happened. You have a relationship, what do you remember about what happened in your relationship? The thing, the time your, your partner just uh, you know, let you down, the time your friend just sort of stood you up, the time they didn't ring, the time they forgot. Isn't that just collecting the faults of life? Collecting the shit? And that particular simile means, look, what went wrong in life, leave that alone. Let that rot in the past, all the mistakes, all the tragedies, all the things which went wrong. Why do we carry that around into our present? Now, this is radical for many people, even when people like, you suffer the death of a loved one. It might be your daughter, your son. Why do you put that in your basket and carry that around day after day, month after month, year after year? Why is it that people just can't let grief go? They're shit collectors. Now this is part of your personality and you need someone to really give you a kick up the backside and that's why I mentioned the shit, to really make this a hard teaching. You need to hear this to realize this is what I'm doing. So why not just let that rot in the past, the pain, the difficulties, the disappointments, and instead carry the happy moments you've had. I mentioned that in the story about my father when he died. Instead of remembering his death, I called his life like a concert. At the end of a concert, I never cried. I never felt sad when the concert was over because I remembered the concert, not the ending. In the same way that when a loved one has died and they're no longer there for you, why do you remember what's been taken away? Why can't you remember what you've had, all those wonderful years you've had together with your beautiful wife, with your great father, with this child who's actually come into your life for six weeks and you've been able to love them, they've met you, they've come, they've visited you. 
Why not remember that instead of the tragedy of their death? Why don't collect the X and keep the X rather than the dung and the poo? Now when you see what you're doing, now you can understand why people do get depressed. Because they tend to, tend to incline towards the false, towards the negative, and they collect that. And look, if you collect too much shit, anyone would get depressed. And when people think, life sucks, life is terrible, life is awful, look what's happened to me. And all you're seeing is a part of your life, you're seeing the two bad bricks of your past, and that's what you're carrying into your present, into your future. Instead of seeing all the other 998 good bricks of your past. And if you look, and if you look with a, with a fair mind, an open mind, you'll find that just about everybody in this world, hardly any exceptions to this, there's 998 good bricks to every two bad bricks. The beautiful, happy, successful moments of your life far outweigh the faults and problems, things which go wrong. The problem is that we just take the good stuff for granted. We don't collect it, we don't cherish it. Instead we just cherish what goes wrong and the faults. This is our nature, we have to change that nature if we can overcome the depression. So please don't you be a shit collector. Just make a determination. I'm going to leave that in the past. You can do this. And for anybody who keeps telling me, no, you've got to learn from the mistakes of the past, no, that does not work. Ask any professional psychologist. You learn much more from the successes of the past, not the mistakes. Look, example, your relationship, your marriage. If you keep remembering what went wrong in your relationship, you know, you're on the, the way to, to divorce, separation. Because what you do, you sort of start blaming and try, your fault, no, it's your fault. You just get make it worse. What happens if you let those thoughts go and you remember all the beautiful times when the relationship was a wonderful time, the great moments you had together? What does that do? That means you appreciate the relationship, you appreciate the partner, and you will actually learn what works. And you will repeat what works. If it, you had a nice time together, you decided just to go off to Broome or somewhere just you know, for the weekend, had a great time. If you remember that, you'll do it again. You learn from successes much more than you ever learn from mistakes. And also you avoid this terrible trap of depression. However, there is painful times in life. You know, there is times when the person has just died, you have lost your job, you know, you are sick, you've just been told that you've got your biopsy results have come through and you have got a cancer. But there's another of the great stories which Buddhism helps with, the great story of the Emperor's Ring. This too will pass. And that just solves so many depressions because you can allow it to go, you don't keep it. That particular story of the Emperor's Ring, there was a young man who became an emperor and every time his kingdom was going well, he would hold parties and celebrations. Every time the things were going bad in his kingdom, economy down, sort of credit crunch, uh, people just uh, upset at his tax reforms or whatever. Every time, every time things were going difficult for him, he'd just stay in his room and get angry and depressed. He'd sulk. And eventually, his advisors had to try and teach him what to do. And you these people in power, you can't actually tell them directly, because once you get into power you get arrogant. You have to actually use psychology to teach people a lesson, especially like an emperor. So the ministers were wise enough to know how they could help the emperor without telling him directly what he was doing wrong. They presented him with a ring, a gold ring which was very simple except for the words which were engraved on the outside. This too will pass. And I've told this story for many years and actually one of you, I don't know if you're here this evening, they actually came up and they actually went to the jeweller and they got a ring like that and they actually did engrave those words around their ring so they could remember it too. The Emperor's Ring, is actually they exist in, in Perth. At least one person has one. And they gave this ring to the Emperor to wear at all occasions. So when things were going wrong, he'd look at that ring, this too will pass. 
But just knowing it will pass, reminding yourself of that obvious truth means you never get so depressed. And I've told that to many prisoners in jail, especially when they first go into jail. And that's just so humiliating. It's one of the most humiliating times of a person's life. They're a prisoner, they're in jail. They've been publicly humiliated, they've done a crime, and they're wearing this green and they're treated just like with no human rights, subservient to the prison officers. It's one of the most awful moments in your life. And I just tell them, look, it will pass. You know, two years, five years, ten years, the time will come when you walk out of that jail. And the time will come, you look back upon that experience, way in the past, it's gone, it's finished. Bear with it, it will pass, and you know it does pass. You know, the radiation therapy, the chemotherapy, it does pass. The sickness, it passes. The grief, the tears, they do pass. You know it's going to pass. So remembering that takes away a lot of the pain, knowing it's not going to last. Now, but the best part of that story is that emperor would look at that ring during the good times and the prosperous times as well. This too will pass. Now, this was a brilliant part of that story. It meant when things were going well, when you have a beautiful relationship with your partner, when you're healthy, you, things are going well in your life, the economy is prospering, your football team is winning. When that happens, remember, this too will pass. That's not being negative or depressed. What that means is actually when things are going well, you never take them for granted. You've got this beautiful relationship with a great person. You don't take it for granted. You work your butt off to look after that relationship, to cherish it, to care for it. You really work hard to make sure that that prosperity lasts as much as it could, can. Because one of the problems with failure, people take it for granted. They don't put effort or care or love into their relationship. Sometimes like what happens when people get married, they get that ring on their finger, the wedding ring, and they think, right, that's it now, we've committed, we don't have to work. And you know that's just the start of the work, you always have to work. Never take anything for granted. It will pass, so you keep working hard. And that way the prosperous times lasted longer than ever. Which is another way of overcoming depression. Remember, this too will pass. Simple. But it's just so powerful. The next little story of how to overcome depression, it was, why is it that just whenever we are criticized, we hear it straight away. When we're praised, we just dismiss it. Which causes us what we actually eat. You know, what we eat in our mind, what we actually hear. We hear junk food all the time. Depression, depressive stuff, criticism. Know what the things you do wrong. Praise, which is healthy food for the mind, we just reject it all the time. I think I told the story a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago. When I got the John Curtin Medal in 2004, I had to give an acceptance speech. When I gave that acceptance speech, I said, and some of you were there at the time, you may remember this, I said, I'm quite surprised I've got this award. I never expected it. And I'm sure there are many other people in our community who work much harder than I do, who deserve it much more than me. And anyway, I couldn't get this without all these other people behind me. People like the committee, the BSW, Buddhist Society, my fellow monks who look after me. All of you, I couldn't have done this by myself. So really, I don't really deserve it, but thank you anyway. And that was the sort of speech which I gave. One year later, I thought, well, people come to my medal ceremony, I should go to another person's ceremony. It's like karma, you know, what you get you should give. So I went to the next year's ceremony when it was Professor Jofi. He was the head hematologist at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. And the reason why he got the John Curtin Medal for to that year was that he had seen that being a hematologist, that people who were going into Charlie Gardner's hospital for chemotherapy, radiation therapy, were getting top class treatment, but they were walking out of that hospital without any care. So what he told us was that he decided to kick out a few people from the rooms. And these rooms in a hospital, they're just like gold dust. He used his authority to kick out a few people and he turned it into the Brown's Alternative Therapy Center where you can get Reiki, homeopathy, 
uh, foot massage, anything weird, you can get it in that place. <laughs> and sponsored by Brown's Dairy. And when he did this, you know, all of his peers thought, you were going crazy, you're going a bit troppo, because all this sort of stuff was not really recognized by mainstream medicine. And here was a big professor you know, putting his reputation on the line so that anybody who had radiation therapy or chemotherapy could go there afterwards and get some Reiki or get a massage free of charge. And I knew what was happening, I know the way the mind works. It is, I don't care whether Reiki works or homeopathy works or foot massage works or not, but I do know that someone is caring for you. A one-on-one -on -one person just, just pressing your feet with care for half an hour. That works. Just compassion and kindness. Someone actually being with you, looking after you. When you have massage, you're in the moment, you're giving compassion. I said in meditation, that heals. I know that. So I thought, that guy was so sharp and so wise. And of course, he was mentioning that already the research had come through, it was actually making a significant improvement in people's health. It was working. And so when I heard what he did, I thought, my goodness, what a, what a hero, what a courageous man, standing his ground for something he believed in and actually getting it working and actually stopping a huge amount of suffering with people who got cancers. And when he got up to, to accept his award, he said, well, there are other people in the community who deserve it much more than I do. I'm not sure, quite sure why you chose me and I couldn't have done this without all the other people who helped me. And I recognized it was pretty much the same speech I said the year before. <laughs> As everybody does when they receive a reward. Someone praises you, gives you a award, and what do you do? You say, I don't deserve it. Maybe there's other people who deserve it more than me. Or I couldn't do this, it wasn't for my parents or my partner or my friends. And I realized my mistake there. Look, a lot of people actually investigated and they looked at what I was doing and they decided, yes, I deserve it. And I was actually saying, you're wrong, you're lying. So it was Jofi, when he did deserve it, it was obvious. So the next time I ever get an award, when I give my speech, the first words I will say will be, thank you, I deserve this. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> you're laughing because it's not done, is it? You know, if someone gives you a award, you say, I deserve it. That's just really just out of left field. You're not supposed to do that, and that is the problem. We just refuse to accept praise and rewards. We just push it aside every time. So look, the next time someone tells you, you did a marvelous act today, you did really great work, say thank you, yes, I deserve it. Next time your husband says, oh thank you, it's a delicious meal darling, say yes, thank you, it was, I deserve it. Next, <laughs> now, when you do that, you're actually going to stop a lot of depression. But when someone criticizes you, you know, you are late picking me up today, oh yeah, that's true, I'm sorry. Why is it we always re receive pra uh, criticism straight away? Over in Sydney, uh, in May, I was at a conference, <laughs> listening to one of the Buddhists over there, a great sort of uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, N. Kong Tan, and he was actually saying, research shows that if you're going to praise someone, you have to send, spend 15 seconds praising them before it actually gets in. 15 whole seconds, and then it will actually be received. Criticism, one second, it goes straight in. <laughs> it's true. Which is why that if you are going to be praising your child, or maybe praising your wife, don't just say, oh thank you darling, you're a wonderful wife. No, you've got to say, thank you darling, you're a wonderful wife, you're a great cook, you're so charming, I'm very happy that I managed to find you, and that managed to, I'm so lucky you fell in love with me, and you're such a charming person, and we've had such a wonderful time together, 15 seconds up, it might go in. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually true, you try that, you know it's true. Now is it quite clear where depression comes from? We just don't receive praise. What we receive is criticism. It goes straight in. So if we want to sort of stop depression, for goodness sake, when someone praises you, compliments you, or give you a medal, please receive it immediately. You do deserve it. 
if your partner says thank you for being you don't think that they're speaking rubbish don't just demean their intelligence say thank you darling yes you're right I deserve that and have your partner also receive it and then when praise is not dismissed we may have more of it in our marriage we may have more of it in our office because when you dismiss these things someone you praise someone they just throw it back at you of course you're just discouraging praise when you're discouraging praise you're discouraging mutual appreciation you're actually discouraging love when you discourage love what's left it's terrible negativity fault finding pointing out people's faults and I feel I'm terrible and I must be the worst monk ever since the time of the Buddha I'm really terrible, I'm awful and if you keep thinking like that of course you get depressed so this is actually where we're actually healing depression by just changing our the way we look at things and getting that positive and receiving positive, receiving praise looking at the 998 good bricks in the wall I mean, this too will pass, this actually works and collecting the eggs not the shit from the past now, I did also mention that sometimes we get depressed because just what we want in life is way too much it's a crazy stuff you know, the, one of the experiences I had as a kid no not as a kid I was a school teacher 22 just before I went off to Thailand to become a monk and this is very apt right now because this was World Cup in 1970 73? Must be 72. 74? It was World Cup. I don't know. Anyway, around that time, I would never forget this. There was a, a qualifying match England versus Poland. Remember, I was English. You're watching it on the TV. England only needed to draw to go through to the, the finals. And it was a close match. They were winning 1 0. And then the last moment, Poland scored. <laughs> and England got knocked out. It was a match, it was a good match, exciting, and I enjoyed it. The next day I went to school. Here were the kids. There was 900 kids in that school. And all the staff were all looking down at the floor. You know kids are usually, you know, teenagers, they're usually sometimes naughty in class. This day there was no discipline problems at all. Because they just couldn't bear to be naughty. They were just so depressed. And I thought, it's a blooming football match. What are you getting depressed about? It's only soccer. Why are you going to spoil a, a whole day about that? And the reason is because people just have far too many expectations and desires. When we desire so much, what actually happens is, I can actually see it's a stupid desire. Asking from the world what it can never give you. Australia will never win the World Cup. Come on, look, be practical about this. <laughs> I say things like that, people get shocked, but it's obvious, isn't it? It's true. So asking from the world what it never gives us. And now what happens when we ask, you know, you're going to die, you're going to get old, you're going to get sick, it's just the nature of this world. No, your husband is going to sort of argue with you, your wife is going to sort of you know, drive you crazy sometimes. That's what a marriage is like. So don't ask from a relationship what it can never give you. Because when you ask what life can never give you, what happens next is you get frustrated. And when life so forth disappoints you, you know who you blame. You don't really blame your partner. You don't blame your boss, you blame you. People actually think they're failure because the marriage never worked, because they got sat from work, because their team never won. Even You're not even playing on the pitch, but you're a supporter. Why do you take responsibility and feel sad about it? The supporters take blame, they didn't cheer loud enough or whatever, I'm not sure. But it's amazing to see that psychology well, we take the blame of failure on ourselves. We get depressed. So actually, once you realize what desire actually does, please don't desire what the world will never give you. Keep your desires you know, in, in the parameters of practicality, of possibility, of what you, know, you can achieve. 
you know, what's you know, obvious you know, within your grasp. Don't reach too far. But when people do reach too far, the other thing which happens, they get this frustration. But because of our society, which is a you-can-do-it society, you're just not wise enough, you're not trying hard enough. Go to an Anthony Robbins seminar. Yes, you can be rich. You can get the person of your dreams. Just put it in your mind. Think about it. Visualize it. And don't give up. Have faith in your dreams and you will reach them. That's so much crap, isn't it? <laughs> you know, be honest about it. But it's not just that, it's actually so dangerous, it causes so much depression. It's actually dangerous. Because what happens, that people actually try even harder. They get frustration, they try harder, and they get angry. I don't know how many angry people are in this world. Why do they get angry? Apparently that's what poor old Kevin was for. He was really trying hard, had so much expectations, got frustrated, got terribly angry with himself and his staff and his friends. After anger, there's another stage. You get angry, angry, angry. That takes up so much energy. The next stage is depression. What's the point? You lose all your energy, you lose all your hope. You tried, you pushed yourself and you think it's your fault. You didn't sort of do the right thing, you made the wrong choices. And that's another form of depression. All come because you just reached too far, strived too much, and thought that you could achieve these things when you weren't really working within the limitations of real life. And I know that. You know, sometimes I know that Sort of, I give a talk on a Friday night, sometimes they're going to be really good ones, sometimes bad ones. You can't make them all good ones. Sometimes you tell jokes and people really get it, and sometimes the, you know, they just miss the whole joke, just like you do sometimes. <laughs> and that's just life, isn't it? You can't do anything. So that when you actually work within the parameters of life, and you're wise enough to know, you know what you can achieve, what life can give you, what it can't, then you don't have any stupid desires, these obsessive goals, which actually, they actually just, they crucify you. Give you so much pain and suffering, and you just get angry, you keep pushing until you just give up and you get depressed. So in Buddhism we say, well, what do you really want in life anyway? What's your goal in life? You don't, we all know, I don't know how many times you say this, you don't need to have the million dollars to be happy, you know, and I'm one of the examples of that. I've got absolutely nothing. And I'm a pretty happy guy. Come and watch me. Just don't get really upset. You don't need to have a beautiful partner. I've got no partner. I'm celibate. And for those of people who say that celibacy is the biggest sexual deviation, I think somebody actually said that. It was, it was who was it now? Oh, they told me the other day. I said Freud. Freud actually said there's only one sexual deviation, that's celibacy. Uh-oh, <laughs> that's me. But I'm going to form a new society, it's celibate rights. <laughs> and I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to be marching in the next Gay and Lesbian Pride, because Gay and Lesbians have got their rights now, the celibates, we're the ones who are suffering, we're the ones who are being discriminated against. So it's celibate rights. <laughs> Sometimes people say it's unnatural to be celibate, and they said that same as gays, it's unnatural to be gay. And I say it's unnatural to be celibate. I say, no, no, I'm demanding my right to be celibate. <laughs> but anyhow, I don't get into that anyway, I forget now. But so what you demand in life, but please put that into to proper perspective. So you don't demand too much. But the last part of and that actually gets rid of a lot of depression. So you don't need that's what I'm going to, you don't need to have all these things to be peaceful and happy. You should know that by now. You've been coming here long enough. So get the message. Yeah. All of these cravings and desires, doesn't, you don't have to win the match. Just enjoy the game. It's obvious. It, you don't have to sort of, uh, you know, get the sort of promotion. You get the promotion, more stress. 
They keep on saying, you never have enough money, no matter how much you go up the corporate ladder, there's never enough money for you, you know that. So, you know, why does work so hard for the promotion? Just work so hard for just enjoyment, fulfillment, not some promotions. So you're actually doing it for happiness, you're not doing it for status. Do it like that and you can achieve happiness. Status, you know, who wants that? But the last part of this is perhaps the most profound. And that is just like life sometimes does go wrong, it's not perfect. So don't expect this life just to be all wonderful, beautiful, things always going right and everything going your, your way. There will be many, many times when things do go wrong, many times when your loved ones do die and it's that's sad. And many times when you, know, you do lose on the stock market and it's sad. There's many times when you do get expelled from the monastery where you grew up in and it's sad. That's with the bhikkhunis. There are many, many times when you do miss your flight and it's sad, but that's life. Life isn't meant to be totally perfect. So we accept there will be depressing moments in life, moments of just disappointment. But we understand and accept that as part of life. We don't make anything worse of it. One of my favorite pictures of my teacher Ajahn Chah, which I have in my room, my office in Bodhinyana Monastery in Serpentine, is Ajahn Chah with his hands up, with a big smile on his face. He's imitating a famous statue in a monastery in the south of Thailand. And in that statue there is the inscription underneath. This monk just blissed out in ecstasy and the, ex the inscription says, Joy at last to know there's no happiness in the world. <laughs> oh, and that is just so profound and so helpful too. Joy at last to know there's no happiness in the world in the sense you're never going to be always happy, that sometimes you're going to get sad. Joy at last to know there's nothing wrong with you if you get upset. Joy at last to know there's nothing wrong with you if you cry. Joy at last to know you can be you. <laughs> oh, what a relief. You know, it's just so hard being somebody else. It's so hard just you know, living up to society's expectations of what you should be and what you should do and how you should speak. And you can't cry and you can't laugh and you can't, you can't be in life. So that was actually saying, Joy at last to know that you can cry, that you can be happy, that you can smile, that you can slip over, you can make a fool of yourself. Joy at last to know there's no perfect perpetual happiness in this world. Now that is joy. Now that is the real happiness. Now once you understand that, you understand how one of the greatest ways of getting through depression, joy at last there's no happiness in this world so you stop trying to be anything different than you are. Which means you make peace with yourself. Which means you let go. Which means you just sit here, not trying to meditate, not trying to get anywhere, just being. That's why this art of meditation is not trying to get somewhere, not trying to be something different than you are, not having this great idea of, of you know, spiritual experiences and seeing the Buddha in golden light coming towards you and teaching you the meaning of the universe and so everything is perfect, you're enlightened forever after. All of those sort of fantasies, that's not what meditation is about. If we don't meditate to try and get something, to achieve anything, we meditate to let go of things. And in particular, we let go of that craving of that wanting to be somewhere where we're not. I often say that the root cause of suffering is being here and wanting to be somewhere else. If you want to be somewhere else other than where you are, that's called suffering. And how are you going to overcome that problem? Trying to get somewhere else is endless. You spent all your life going places. Anywhere but being here, being you. The end of suffering is where I am, that's where I want to be. 
letting go. So if you can do things like that, where I am, this is where I want to be. You're sitting here in meditation, you get incredibly peaceful. You find that all the cause of this negativity which causes depression, all the cause is just trying to go somewhere, get somewhere, be something. If you let that one go, you'll stay home. However you are, that's who you are. Tired, restless, sleepy, brilliant, stupid. We all go through these stages. This too will pass. You just be who you are. And then you find you have this incredible peace and energy and clarity and brightness. You discover that perhaps the most fundamental cause of depression is the fact that you deprive your mind, your heart of energy because you're so busy doing things, going places. You never enjoy where you are. Another favorite saying of mine, every time, this is money, every time you want more money, you cannot enjoy what you already have. Take away money. Every time you want something else, you can't enjoy what you have right now. Because the wanting takes you away. Takes you away from enjoying this moment. Having to work hard, to strive, to push yourself, to suffer. Thinking that, yeah, when I get that thing, then I'll be happy. But all your desires, all your cravings will always be unfaithful to you. They promise you happiness, but as soon as you get them, you want something else. That's what I call unfaithful. Craving is unfaithful. Promises you something, but never delivers, so you want something else. Always moving. Understanding that, you understand that where I am is where I want to be. If I am wanting something, I can't enjoy what I already have. So enjoy what you have. Please enjoy your partner. Please enjoy your little temple, please enjoy this talk, please enjoy you, please enjoy this weather. If you want it to be different, you are suffering. We learn that in our meditation practice, just to leave things alone, to let things be. Once you can do this in meditation, you find you have all the peace and happiness you could ever want. And then you try and do that in life, it just happens. You learn it here, and you practice it out there. This is like a gym. Well, you learn how to lift weights, you know, run on these machines to get fit. But here you're, you're learning how to let go, how to be. Not to fight. And then you find you have all the happiness and peace you ever want in the world. You also find that the energy of your mind, its bare energy, comes from stillness. The more you do, the more you strive, the more you wear your mind out. It's what Ajahn Chah used to say. Never understood it until you really got into your meditation. If you want to have a powerful body, exercise it. If you want to have a powerful mind, keep it still. Stop doing things. And you do that, and your mind gets more and more energy. Dullness disappears. You get so much energy that depression just cannot, cannot sort of exist. Knowing that, the brightness, the brilliance, the energy, the happiness, which always comes with energy. Knowing that, you realize that one of the greatest causes of depression is people's brain has been worked too hard. So you've got no energy left. And what do people do when they get depressed? They try and exert energy, try to force themselves out of depression. And that gets them spiraling downwards. The more you try, the more you're using up the little amount of energy you do have. So you've got even less. Go down, 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 down. So one of the great ways of overcoming that depression, let it be. Stop fighting. Make peace with your depression. Open the door of your heart to being depressed. And see what happens. When you stop fighting, energy starts to come back. You've got a natural source of energy, now you're not wasting it. 
getting negative about being negative. Leave it alone, let it be. And you'll find energy comes back. Energy brings happiness and clarity. And depression like a fog lifts from your heart. This is the deepest way, when you really know how to meditate. But please don't meditate with force. Don't strive, don't struggle. That makes it worse. Let it go. Let it be. It's because the monks and nuns have been meditating for years know how to do this. We can just let go of things so easily. Which means when life goes wrong, things suck. That's fine, it's just life. Joy at last, know there's no happiness in this world. Whoa! <laughs> when you do things like that, you get peace, you get energy, your mind gets happy. Which means when everybody else is sad and distressed, you will always have a smile on your face. Those are the ways of overcoming depression. They're very powerful. Which is why British National Health Service, the uh, research arm, the National Institute for Clinical Health and Excellence, they call it NICE, they whisk out the H, I don't know why, in the acronym. When they did research some years ago to find out the best way of treatment of, of uh, depression, they found with a huge clinical trial, the most effective way, the way which worked the very best, was meditation. Hopefully you know why. But not meditation which forces, meditation which makes peace, which allows energy to come back. And with that energy, joy and happiness. That's how to overcome meditation. How to overcome depression, <laughs> not meditation. <laughs> How to overcome depression. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, so in that talk I gave a few old stories, a few old uh, things which you've read before, but I wanted to put it all in one talk. So any comments or questions about the talk this evening? Yes? I think it's... It's an interesting question because, you know, I, I wrote that story a long time ago and then people ask, where's the wall? And I, did, I had to go looking for it because I t totally forgot it. And it was a case that at the time it was such a big thing for me. But then when I realised, oh, there's 998 good bricks in the wall, I forgot about those two bricks and I forgot where they were. I think they're in the, the monk's toilets. Because <laughs> that, that was actually the first building we did there. So it must have been in there somewhere. But anyway, because that's such a famous story now, one of these days I'm going to get sort of a brick layer and do, put like in the front of the monastery just so people can get their photograph taken by my two bad bricks <laughs> and actually just to make one there with two really crooked bricks so people can see it. It's almost like a tourist attraction. But it's a powerful story because it actually has helped so many people. It works. So any other questions anybody has to... Oh yes, in the back there. I deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a very nice thing you said. Thank you very much. You <laughs> Very good. <laughs> See, doesn't that make you happy? Yes. Well, Go on. When I find someone that is depressed who may be a friend or an acquaintance or whatever, I find it very difficult to know what to do. Would you have any suggestions? Uh, yeah, this is a common question. You say that when you meet a friend who's very depressed, you don't know really what to do. Uh, whenever you're in a situation like that, number one, please don't have plans. Please don't have like a book you know, which is what I'm supposed to do. Because all of that, I call that knowledge, you know, all of your ideas of what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to treat this, actually stops you being sensitive. So the best thing to do in any situation, I've done this for so many years now, when someone comes up and they're in a really difficult situation, and I have had no training, I just completely let go, make my mind blank, I don't remember what I'm supposed to do, or what worked in the past. I just let all of that go, come into the present moment, 
put a bit of loving kindness and compassion in there. And I trust in that presence and kindness. With that, I'm sensitive enough. So sometimes I'm depressed. And, you know, the wrong, it's the wrong thing to do to try talking to them. Sometimes just an arm around their shoulder, but sometimes an arm around the shoulder they might punch you. So you're really sensitive. And that sensitivity and that kindness, that's what works the best. And then see what happens. Ideas come up, um, words come out, and sometimes, no, I don't know where those come from. But as long as I'm silent, as long as I'm kind, as long as I don't you know, try and repeat what worked last time, or remember some of the instructions in the book, then it usually works. And that happens in all, all situations and cases. So always, this is an old saying of mine, it's just, never allow knowledge to stand in the way of truth. Because knowledge is what, you th what you're supposed to do, what's in the book, how you've been trained. And truth is actually what's right in front of you right now. And there's a huge amount of difference there. So just be in that moment, be with that person, and you actually feel what needs to be done. And I don't know what that is. Just happens, comes out. You got a question there? Yeah? Is depression uh, not um, privilege or, or disgrace or error? It's not something just for certain people. Anyone can get it, right? Yes, everyone gets depression from big depression, small depression, from time to time in their life. It's part of life. Okay, yes, I think you're saying, uh, just again for the tape, that like depression is almost like, like a mental starvation, a mental sickness, a mental dis-ease. And I think it's very true there. And you were saying that just like your body, if it has good food, good exercise, it becomes healthy and doesn't get so sick. But even if you have good food and you exercise, you still get coughs and colds and sicknesses from time to time. That's just the nature of a body. It's the same with the nature of the mind. If you give it good food and exercise the mind, meditation is one of the best exercises, it still sometimes you know, has depressions. That's what I was saying, that happiness at last, you know, to know, joy at last, there's no happiness, no perfect happiness in this world. So just accept this. But when you do practice or learn some of these strategies from Buddhism, you find that you know, depression hardly comes at all. And if it does come, it's just so mild. You know exactly what to do, just leave it alone. Enjoy your depression. You can have a day off work. You can sit in bed and get your partner to feed you. And, you know, get all these people coming around, oh I've heard you're depressed. And then they're nice and kind to you. So if you ever do get depressed, please milk it for all it's worth. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's right. Yes, a very good thing there. If you s tell someone, please get over it, the people feel more guilty and they have to strive more and they get worse, they get deeper in there. But just being with people, telling them a joke, the depression joke. <laughs> Many of you may have heard this before, but it's a joke which actually is about depression. It's about the painter in Perth. He's quite actually a well-known painter, but he was on his motorbike and had a crash. Had to go to hospital, and had to amputate his hand. It was the very hand he used for painting. And you know, when you have injuries like that, many people, you know, get depressed. So that when he was, you know, got released from hospital, he had psychiatrists and counsellors, but you know, he was just playing along with them. 
he realized without being able to paint, his life had no meaning. So he said as first opportunity he would kill himself. So he went to St. George's Terrace, you know, went on one of those big buildings, went out onto the balcony. He was about to throw himself off, kill himself, when he saw a man with no arms at all. No arms at all. And he was actually dancing down St. George's Terrace. Dancing for joy. It was one of those occasions he thought, look, I've only lost a hand. That guy down there has got no arms and he's dancing. He said, why do I want to kill myself? So he got off from the balcony, he got into the elevator, they go really down fast. He managed to sort of run after this guy to thank him. He hugged, you know, he hugged him and he said, look, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was about to jump off this ledge and kill myself because I've lost one hand. You've lost both arms and you're just so happy. I saw you dancing for joy. Tell me your secret. And the man said, sir, I wasn't dancing for joy. I was just trying to scratch my bum. <laughs> I said, anyway, if you've got no arms... <laughs> well, okay, I think that's a great, a great time to actually end this evening's talk on depression. So you'll all go out with a smile on your face.